welcome to episode 31 of the Living Memory Association podcast, which celebrates pubs of Edinburgh and all their glory through the eyes of those who drank in them. We embark on a pub crawl from the 1930s all the way to the 1980s, from the Old Chain Pier to Sneaky Pete's via Barney Battles, The Diggers, The Black Swan, and many more stops along the way. Back time we go. Some of the publicans were great characters. Betty Mostyn, the old Jane Pier, who was, uh, she used to wear a silk kimono. Her son was harbour master out in mm. Singapore or somewhere like that. And he sent her, sent her the silk kimono that she wore with bamboo framed spectacles. And little old lady shuffled around. He commanded that place, yeah. Mm. I mean, there was no hot water behind the bar. The only hot water there was a geezer in the ladies' okay. loo. The gents' loo was plastic strip curtain, you step through it and there was about two foot to stand in and there was a trough that went through the floor down into the river fourth. We, I mean the walls were covered in, well, centrefolds from Playboy, which was pretty risky to do that in those days. Uh, and all sorts of bric-a-brac and knuckle dusters and all sorts of things hanging around the place. It was the first pub in Edinburgh to get a colour television. I remember one occasion being in and the last night of the proms was Sir Malcolm Sargent conducting, but the volume was turned down to nil and Irish rebel songs were playing on the record player. Again, closing time, uh, I remember no drinking up time at all, 10 o'clock on the dot, Betty fired a starting pistol a couple of times pulled a sword out from hanging behind the bar and shuffled round the bar poking the sword in people's ribs and just taking their drinks away. Betty used to wear bamboo glasses and if you were a customer and she knew you she'd be sitting at the back under the heat lamp and she'd turn around and see you coming in and say right go and help yourself I'll be there the now and you helped yourself in whatever you wanted but Betty used to be, uh, get her curtains they, they weren't actually curtains they were blankets and she actually got from Martins and George Street and she had them made into curtains they were bright red coloured. She also had the television on, on all the time, but you couldn't hear the telly on because all she did was play the record on the sash, and you got that all day long. And she had a, a big settee right in the middle of the bar, and her dog used to sit on that. But if any tourists happened to come and sit in there, and Betty would come up there and she wanted the dog to sit down, she would transfer language and tell them to, to move. The, the, the dog wanted to sit down, and she couldn't change the, the beer if the tide was in because the tide used to come in into the cellar and that's how she kept the beer cool. She used to have a big cudgel behind the bar at closing time and she used to bang on the counter. Right, get yourselves out of here before I come back you with us. Yeah. That, yeah. Was, that was Betty. Good, good pint of beer you got in there. And her son actually was a harbour master in Hong Kong and, and she stayed directly opposite the pub. And she had a sister who, who was chalking cheese. Entirely different. She was a lady compared to Betty, because Betty was choice for her language. She used to have a, a wee bit at the back where you could step outside and look out in it. And it got broke. The tourists would go to see her. And she says, I've lived to see him, he's broke my, broke my fence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it jutted out into the. I into just the looked out in the water. Yeah. yeah, onto the water at yeah. the seafront. Yeah, yeah, the harbour front. Yeah, yeah. just looked out in the harbour. Betty was a character. So we we decided to have a dinner party, and we had it in the beehive, and we had it in the just finished, and you won't know this, Prince Charles room, which I created on the top floor of the beehive when he was a Royal Naval officer at Rosyth. He had to have a dining room to come to, in the city, with bulletproof windows his own access and his own furniture and it was beautiful and we had it for that one dinner. Well I'll tell you about the black swan in the snug bar. Well, my granny and another four or five Irish women that had come over at the same time used to meet and they were very respectable women. They went to mass every morning but they met in the jug bar and had a glass of stout and talked about Ireland I suppose homesick and I used to go across at nine o'clock um, I was only five and carry a big jug up to the lodgers and they were in a big room with a table and five beds and I used to put the jug on the table and they drank it. One of my favourites was always the central bar at Fruitleaf Walk. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I had my stag party in the back room there. Mm -hmm. Those days the stag nights were much mm. less involved. We got the back room and we 
drank rum dry. We drank a lot of beer and sang what are euphemistically called rugby songs, as I recollect. <laughs> and then we got turfed out at closing time, which was 10 o'clock, of course. 10 o'clock was always a bit silly. I remember being turfed out of Greyfriars Bobby on, on a June evening and having drunk the last two or three pints very quickly because we all looked to get around in and uh, closing time was approaching. You're yeah. hanging around outside in the sunlight, <laughs> the sun in the sky. Yeah. What do we do now? Do we go home? You know, and it yeah. didn't... <laughs> Yeah, people would hang around outside pubs and not disperse. It was up to Fear Mile Head yes. and we went up Kirkcaton. Yes. And from Kirkcaton to Allermuir and then down to the Kirkburn. And we followed the Kirkburn all the way to the to Glen Course. Uh -huh. And then up to the Logan Lee, yeah. climbed up the waterfall, cut across and down to the Rickett Norms for a pint or Sunday. Mm -hmm. And we would chap at the door. And at the first time we went greatly... Uh, thing we'd when he discovered, but once he got to know us, the chap at the door and he said, Oh, come in, lads. And we were taken through to the back room where all the locals, I hope I don't, no, I know, because most of the old locals will be dead yeah, now, no. were playing dominoes and sitting pints. And he said, Now, listen, lads, if you hear the bell or the door, right. just keep it keep it quiet. And then there would be the bell would ring and he would go at the door and then he'd come out and one of the local worthies would come in, aye, I'll have a pint, aye. Right, yeah. And we actually... You were going to buy travellers. Yes, <laughs> well we weren't actually because you, uh, it was a bit nearly Glasgow I think you had to come from. I'm not sure what the There were Glasgow. hotels in, mm -hmm. there were the odd hotels in Princess Street that when we were at art college we could go and get one on a Sunday if we wanted one where you just signed the book and you could write anything aye. and they didn't give a damn. Aye. And we would write travel from Glasgow to Edinburgh going back to Glasgow, put in the time, that was it. And they didn't actually yeah. care. My first memories of pubs when I first came to Edinburgh was going to the, the grass market and the Cowgate, because that were the pubs there were open later, like midnight, one o'clock in the morning. And this was all like, oh, novelty and a great... A great thing today was to to get served drink after after eleven o'clock at night when it was the norm for for pubs shutting. Well, it used to be when I first started drinking, it was ten o'clock at night the shut, and then it got extended to about eleven. And then when we went down the the grass market or the Cougate, it was uh, twelve one o'clock in the morning. I can remember standing in in Sneaky Pete's in the Cougate, and it was uh, it was packed, and you couldn't get a seat. Everybody's just standing in the bar with with a pint of uh, kind of sort of lukewarm lager or something and, and thinking that you'd yeah, why am I doing this now? The novelty it had worn off and uh, it was all just becoming um, yeah, just uncomfortable and maybe I was just getting older at that point. Well it's easy for girls then because pubs there weren't pubs in Scotland mm. up until perhaps the late 60s, 70s, there were bars and there were hotel lounges if you like, using these words to define rather than any precise sense. And really Pubs are something that Scotland has learnt from England. Bars were where men went to get drunk, basically. The concept of social drinking uh, really only came into Scotland in, I would say, the 70s, maybe slightly in the 60s, 70s. Food was generally not available. Of course. If you got a mince pie, you were lucky. <laughs> We used to go to this pub called uh, called the Murray Adams down down in Salamander Street, and it was quite quite amazing. Everybody knew everybody well, and everybody had to sing a song. They started on one side of the pub and they worked away all the way right round, and everybody got named by the song that they sang. For instance, there was one uh, there was one lady, elderly lady, used to sing China Doll because she was China Doll. Then there was Uncle Bob. He used to sing a, a song about a tattooed lady, you had nothing nasty about it, but a tattooed lady, and you had all the various bits about her, t and where her tattoos were, but nothing in it un unsightly. And then there was, uh, there was one chap who used to sing, you taught me, taught me to yodel, and he was a beautiful yodeler. And there was other different, I used to sing Fraulein, that's the one I used to sing. So everybody had to sing, and we all knew everybody, and, and had their, their, it was right funny, they used to have their raffle, and you could see whose turn it was to win the raffle to work. <laughs> <laughs> pretty obvious they were right. We were, we were we were there for about five years and we we won it. I think we won a we won a raffle and I think it was a it was a thing like this, one of these um, a lamp a small lamp. We won a lamp. After about five years we won a lamp. Uh, one Christmas I was doing the post, uh delivering parcels and we used to buy our pies at Mason's at the foot of foot of New Human Road and uh, take along to Barney Battles. Apart from the posting you had to stay on the bus we were on a a uh, single decker bus delivering the parcels and uh, a couple of other lads and the bus driver and I would have two or three pints in 
Barney Battle's Booty Row Tavern, which just about filled the place, you know, half a dozen people in it, and it was panic. But the beer there was so cold, you had to let it warm up, and it was after that Christmas holiday, I learned from a, another student friend who'd been delivering from SNN that they couldn't deliver there without consulting their tight tables. Because every high tide, the cellar was flooded. And the kids were bobbing around in seawater. Well, well, if you had the wrong one, you used to take her in what they called the jug bar. It was just a wee, or a wee snug bar, what they call it, whatever they wanted to call it. But there wasn't much room in there. There's no line nowadays where you got proper facilities for women. Returns were a big source of fiddling. And publicans, uh, in a keg, there's a spear that goes down into the middle of the keg. Really? It's connected on the top. And if you had a key, you could unscrew that spear. Quite dangerous, because one or two people impaled themselves by doing it. Uh, but you could then pour in all of your slops and beers from all over the place and then return it to the brewery as being off and demand a credit for it. Well, that sort of thing went on reasonably regularly. In Porter's ex-policeman down at the Duca, do you remember the Duca? Oh, aye, yes. Now, the Duca in his heyday was about as hard a pub as you're ever likely to find. Not unknown for Jack to go out and get three of them off the, the, the floor who were causing trouble, three at a time. He'd put their fingers in the, and hold the door hold them in the hinge. The dog would hold the second one and he'd have the third one up, phone the police. You know, he just went straight in. The toughest guy you ever saw in your life. That is but hard. a gentle giant, they all were. Mm. You know, because, well, we were privileged in the sense we were colleagues. Yeah. But um, by Jove, they could run a ship. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Places you wouldn't dare go in, you know, on, on a company sort of thing, mm. unless you caught their eye. I used to go to Lord Nelson in uh, Trafalgar Street, which was uh, Charlie Kelly's pub. Uh-huh. Uh, but Charlie Kelly, uh, we had the Lord Nelson, B.B. King, who had the village uh, down the road. The village pub. And, and as a, a laddie, but when it comes to bonfire night, he used to get us and say, right, here, there's money. Don't get any fireworks in the pub. And basically them gave us money for to keep away at firework time. So they didn't, the didn't want any fireworks for the, yeah. up near the pub. Huh? Yeah. And is that what would have happened if you had not got um, bribed? Well, be honest, I never knew anybody actually did that. <laughs> but he used to pay in a, in a bunch soon and he did just the money. Then this other guy used to come in and he was drunk and he got barred. Well, he came in the next day. I said to him, you're barred. No, oh, no, not me. I said, you were. I said, Anne put you out yesterday. You were drunk. Must have been my twin brother. <laughs> I had to stand outside the door and wait for my granddad and then when he came out of the pub there used to be a toy shop right next door. I went in, he took me in, asked me what I would like. I got a big dog, he says, right, you get in this, do tell your mum. My first legal drink was in what is now the Star Bank. Oh yes. Uh, it was then Willie Scott's pub. Oh. Uh, that was uh, my local and uh, on my 18th birthday I went down there for the first time. On my own, just thought, right, it's my teeth bursting, we're going to have a pint today. <laughs> so I went down, had a pint, and uh, came home again. And would you have gone uh, illegally? Would you have gone along with pals? Yes. Oh, yes. You didn't go illegally on your own. No, no. Was a, you know. So it was a certain amount. It was a, a group thing, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure it still is. Yeah, yeah. So then we gravitated to probably the best bar that we had found in Edinburgh, which was uh, the Diggers. Well, it was known as the Diggers. It was called the uh, Athletic Arms, and it was at Henderson Terrace, just at uh, Slateford Road. And it was, uh, yeah, it was a it was a busy pub, but it was a yeah dead old fashioned sort of pub and but traditional. And you used just to go there and you just hold your your hand up and you sit with one, two, three finger, however however many pints you wanted, you just put your fingers because everybody. everybody Everybody can you're just drinking McEwan's eighty shilling because it was that was that was the, the best pint and it was renowned as having the best pint in Edinburgh. This was in the I think right back to the fifties. I started drinking in the diggers in the late seventies and it was really creamy. The you know a, a really good head in the pint and really creamy taste, really smooth. I mean you never got a pint eighty shilling like that in any other the boozers. So uh, so yeah, certainly that was it. And uh, Bill Farmer was the bar manager at that time, and it was um, that he'd have about a staff, he had about about half a dozen men just working there the bar, and he just stood at the till, and the men there they just took the orders and served the beer, and then went up to him, and he dealt with all the money at the till and gave 
things the, the bar and their change to give back to the customers and yeah there's something like 10 deep they used to see at the bar and they were all getting served because it's all quick quick fire stuff and the 80 shilling pumps were all gone yeah it was uh, it was great happy days indeed and then as time went on the bill left and the the beer was never quite never quite as good as that again but, but the, the pub didn't change much the sort of appearance of it and that it kept a traditional feel to it and still it's still very much the same as it was the only thing different is that the beer's not quite as good and and now they've got bar maids behind the, the bar which they never had it was always when Bill Farmer was there it was always barmen with their wee maroon jackets on so yeah so and it was called the Diggers what well, the, the real name was the Athletic Arms but it was called the Diggers because it had a, it was in between two graveyards and this was allegedly where the, the grave diggers would go for a quick pint after digging the, the graves so it was the grave diggers shortened to the diggers and that was the, the nickname but it was known through Edinburgh as the Diggers so if you just say to any anybody would have known where the, the diggers was but up above the bar it was the uh, the athletic arms was the name yet. Then it's to next door to the King's Theatre and when I had the opportunity of reinstating that one I discovered that the snug bar shelf had been removed but it was in the cellar and I, I did a wee bit of research and I discovered that Harry Lauder <laughs> used to come in and he had two trams sitting on that shelf at the interval for him. He could cross the lane have his couple of trams and back into the theatre before anybody knew he was out. So it was called the Harry Lauder shelf and it had to be left polished and clean with two glasses on it, ready for him. You know, so I put it back and a wee plaque on it, the Harry Lauder shelf. <laughs> <laughs> then another one I used to go to was the Mary's pub at the corner of the, road, the Junction Street. Cross the Junction Street? Cross, cross by the state, uh, on the corner there. Is that the state uh, picture house? Uh, Aye, aye. And what was the name of the pub? Berries. Berries. Aye, Berries pub. Berries pub. You, you used to get a, a little ex pub. A little policeman used to go in there right. when they were off duty. You always got a little police in that pub. Right. So there was never any bother in there. Yeah, so it was a good one to go to. Aye. Uh, only once I ever saw b- bother in that pub. And I, I don't know how it happened, but it, it, somebody pulled a knife and the police that's how they were on the scene right away. If there was the guy with the knife, then they said, Stand at the bar, and the knife was in his hand. Somebody had put him, stuck his knife through his hand, <laughs> and the, he was stuck to the bar. <laughs> As an easy call that, And when the police tried to get statements of everybody, the police was fired. Uh-huh. Nobody had seen anything. <laughs> Yeah, nobody saw nothing. nothing. Yeah, so he was stuck to the bar. Aye. To the bar with he knife. was stuck to the bar with his knife. <laughs> <laughs> that was because Polish said, Where's the knife? It's still good. There was only one that I well, can remember, which was Willie Scott's bar now, the Star Bank, mm-hmm. where the system seemed to be that uh, if there were a few regulars, he would close the door at uh, 2.30 and you know, five or six of you, and Willie himself would be in the bar mm. and uh, the rule of the house was that everyone bought her own except Willie. Oh, right. Willie got a drink from every round. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the only occasion I can remember him drinking. Uh, mm. Basically if you're a publican you couldn't afford to be drunk. No, no, you know, no. It used to be said that quite a lot of people in the booze industry were either alcoholics or teetotal. <laughs> uh, right. Because uh, seeing St Augustine that I picked up a little while ago was that Total abstinence is much easier than perfect moderation. <laughs> I can understand. <laughs> yes, absolutely, yeah. There was uh, two, two pubs in Edinburgh called Fairleys. Yeah. One was in Lee Street and one was in the, uh, along the shore here. And I don't know if they were connected. The one in Lee Street was mainly for, shall we say, girls going out meeting soldiers and stuff like yeah. that. Or Very late, well uh, censored, John. Uh, yeah. But the one in Leith was just a, they, they played music. Yeah. But at chucking out time, shall we say, this guy at the back of the bar, the whole length of the bar, there was a big cage. And in the cage. <laughs> at the back of the bar, a cage? Uh, above the bar. The bar was about 20 feet long, 30 feet long, and yeah. this cage was all the way along from one end of the bar to the other. And in the cage was a black panther. <laughs> and he used to bring the panther out at chucking out time. Oh, my God. To empty the pub, and he walked about with it on a lead. It was quite, well, I don't know if it was tame or not, but... You didn't see this after nine pints, John, did you? No, no, no. Definitely no. true. No, definitely true. What was the name of the pub, did you say? Uh, Fairleys. In Fairleys? In Commercial Street. And there was a black panther, black panther. and a cage yeah, behind a cage the bar. Behind the bar, yeah. And it, 
And did you ever see anyone getting attacked by the black panther? No, no. Then? He just chucking used to time. bring it out, and uh, he didn't walk about with it. He stood with it at chucking out time. <laughs> and so was it sitting next to him, sort of like a dog? Or no, no. It... it would walk up and down. Yeah, but when he got it out, uh-huh, uh, well, it's, it stayed beside him. Yes. Uh-huh. God, that. That is the most impressive Last mm-hmm. Orders yep. device I've ever heard of. That's it. We couldn't. We actually couldn't believe it when we first saw it. Yeah. But yep, uh, during the night, it would just walk the length of the bar and then turn and come back <laughs> inside this cage. You know? Do you know what the panther was called? No, I, I oh. can't remember. It's been so long ago. But that was that was definite. That's not made up. That's true. And, <laughs> and, was, and was it there for a while? Well, I only saw. We didn't go there an awful lot because it was quite rough. Yeah, pub. and strange. Aye, but, uh, but yeah, every time we were there, it was there. I think you were allowed to do things in these days. I don't know about now, but yeah, I'm not sure if you'd get away with a black panther no, behind the bar these days. Peop- strange creature to have behind the bar, but it was a good chucking out device. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, the must be must have talked about Willie Ross up in the Oxford bar. Mm-hmm. He had a dictionary at the end of the bar of people doing crosswords. I just went to the end of the bar once the big floor polisher. He had a wee workbench at the end of the bar. And he'd Wrap the cord up with insulating tape, and he's sweeping this thing back. <laughs> you just got your pipes out of the way. <laughs> um, he had a wee sitting room with church pews there, with, without cushions, which were <sighs> all ladies, apart from the one from the plumber's got the same through there. Right, right, out the way. Well, he had a sign on the door saying, No dogs allowed. When I asked him why, he explained that in 1962 a dog had peed under the seat in. Lounge. He held a grudge. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, Willie was. He liked regulars, he didn't like strangers. Wasn't too keen on women. There was one lady from the plumbers across the road that drank large gins that was fully accepted. Uh, but I mean, wouldn't have lager, wouldn't have food. I've seen him. Uh, his customer came in. He always had Glen Morangy on the optics, uh, making on whiskey. And uh, I seen him throw someone out. They came in, looked around the bar, silence because it was a stranger. And uh, <coughs> saw the guys, I'll have a Glen Morangy, please. You see, and, uh, that was okay. So he got poured that, handed over. Well, he took the money. And the chap then asked, passed the lemonade because a bottle of lemonade on the counter as often was, you see. At which point, Willie whirled round, slammed the chap's money back down on the counter, <laughs> took the Morangy away, and said, Get out! <laughs> Thank you so much to Bill, Rose, Dick, Stan, the two Johns, the two Ronnies and everyone who shared their memories of Edinburgh pubs. If you have a story to share, please pop in to see us at the Wee Museum of Memory on the second floor of Ocean Terminal in Leith. At the time of recording, we're closed in the midst of the coronavirus, but hopefully you're lucky enough to be listening to the show when the pandemic is but to memory. You can also visit our Facebook page to keep up with our regular events and view our wonderful photo videos and much more on our YouTube channel just by searching for The Living Memory Association. We also have a brilliant website at www.livingmemory.org.uk hosting over 3,000 photos in conjunction with Edinburgh Collected. And also an on-demand radio station called Thelma FM which you can find on Facebook and Mixcloud. Until next time, we bid you farewell.